This time on CarCraft Video, we're gonna get our 67 Mustang Coupe running and driving. The first episode, we did the suspension. We rebuilt the front and rear suspension using parts from Heights. And last episode, we put in our 351 Windsor with a new Holly Sniper and fired her up. Our radiator and air conditioning condenser are in place, and this is a real easy install. What's really cool about these old Mustangs is that there's so much aftermarket support for these. So you wanna upgrade your cooling system. Here's a radiator that bolts right into place of the stock unit. Wanna upgrade your air conditioner or add air conditioning to a car that didn't have it. We've got an under dash unit and a condenser that bolts right to the core support. All these parts are available in the aftermarket. You can buy your, build this whole car out of a catalog. Old Air Products has a couple of great options when it comes to adding or replacing the air conditioning system on this vintage Mustang. They have an underdash unit that's similar to the ones that were dealer installed way back in the 60s, and they've got this system that we've got that bolts, literally bolts into the factory firewall location and replaces all the factory vents on the dash. One of the things I like about it is it looks like the original system, but it replaces everything with modern technology and it bolts right in. Plumbing in the old air AC system under the dash is an easy process. Old air provides all the needed hoses and grommets to get AC, heat, and defrost into our classic Mustang. Our old air products AC system comes complete with everything we're gonna to need to plumb the system. So what we need to do is figure out the routing, plug in the connections that are already made, we'll route the lines and cut them to length, install the fittings and mark their clocking and then we'll take these over to an, either a hydraulic shop or an AC shop, have these crimped, and then they're ready to install. I built a car a few years ago, it was a 66 Mustang Coupe. I used a Schwartz Performance chassis with an 04 Terminator drivetrain and interior. The car that I built debuted at SEMA in 2012 at the Heat Shield Products booth, and it was my first SEMA car. So it was really cool. It just about killed me to build it and get it done in time because I was working a full-time job somewhere else and writing tech ironically for CarCraft at the time. The car was just so well sorted out. It was on a full frame chassis, rack and pinion steering, 04 Cobra engine, the Terminator dual overhead cam, hand built engine with all the aftermarket. We ported the blower, posi port on the blower, uh, a nice aggressive tune by DBR High Performance and man, what a car. You could steer at the back end in almost every gear and boy, it was strong. If there was one that I wish I'd hung on to, that's the closest thing that I can think of to a car that, man, I wish I could just jump in it every once in a while and go for a rip. Among the upgrades we've done in this car is fuel injection. So with that, we want better communication between what's happening in the engine and what the driver sees. So we're gonna upgrade our gauges. This Dakota digital system looks great. It's gonna have a more of a traditional look, but it's gonna fit inside the stock bezel. We've got the option of the transmission Hall effect sender or a GPS speedometer, which is what we're gonna go with. And everything else comes with the system to where you can just plug it in, find your sensor inputs and wire it all up completely. And then you've got really really super accurate information between what's going on in the engine and, like I said, the driver. The other thing we're going to do, since we're keeping the patina on the exterior of the Mustang, we're going to keep some patina on the interior as well and reuse the original gauge bezel. It's going to be neat. So we've got our vintage patinaed bezel all loaded in and it's really quite simple. It just goes back in the stock location and gets connected to the main control box with a single cable. Now the important thing to remember is to make sure that you have access to these wherever you put them under the dash. Keep them out of the way of your feet, but make sure that you can get to them for troubleshooting and just general connections. Now we had to cut apart an inch at a time with the razor knives and jamming the old dash out of there because it was so old and heat soaked and deteriorated that with 
with the old dash in, this wouldn't even fit. So we got a new one from Scott Drake, and this should just go right in just like it came out from the factory. Like Kevin said, our new dash came from Scott Drake, but we got a few other parts as well. Got new seats, a fitted carpet kit, a new grill and front bumper. These pieces are gonna look great when we get them on the car. Our new dash and instrument cluster installed easily and fits perfectly. Now John and I will fit the new carpet kit and seats into our Mustang. Now since our main connection cable comes all the way out here to the glove compartment, I think the best place for the main control box and the GPS sender is right here in the glove box itself. That way I can connect them easily and it's easier to troubleshoot if something goes wrong. Our next step is running new brake lines. So Kevin and I head to our local AutoZone to pick up a spool of 3 16 brake tube and custom make our lines. We're ready to do the brake lines on our Mustang, and what I did was used a piece of TIG wire, aluminum TIG wire, because it bends easily. Started at the master cylinder, at the output for the front axle on the proportioning valve, and came up with a rough shape just to get the length of the line we're gonna need. So I've got a length of 3 16 brake hose, cut and ready to go. And we're gonna use our flaring tool. And there's several of these that are available. These I like the ones that mount in the bench. Brake lines are a 45 degree flare and they're an inverted flare, so there's two steps to the process. And actually with this tool, there are three. So you need to set the brake line in here and the flat portion of the anvil will set the depth that the line needs to be at. Then tighten the top of this vise down and that will keep the line from moving. So we're using 3 16 brake line and this is operation one. It sets the bubble shape of the flare, pull the handle, and it forms the first part of the flare. Once operation one is done, you need to click over to operation two, pull the handle, and you're set. And then you always need to check it to make sure there's no cracks. Any crack in here that you'd see in the shiny part, the flared part, will be a brake fluid leak. Obviously, you don't want that. This one looks pretty good to me. We are just about ready to put the center section for our Ford 9-inch in. This is a quick performance. They set it up for us. You can see the pattern of the teeth here. It's going to give us quiet operation, not going to make a bunch of noise. we got a 350 to 1 gears in it and a limited slip differential, so we'll be spinning both tires, not just one. With the third member in place, now we can put in the rear axles and we can install the bare brakes and bleed out the lines.
thrilled with this. I love driving the car, Kevin. I'm, I'm about to steal it from you and take it right back to California. <laughs> and you're not a Ford guy. Nope. Yep. This was a, what was it? It's like a 216 cubic inch inline six cylinder. Um, just the base engine, the four lug base drum brake suspension. It's just good, honest performance from a naturally aspirated truck motor. The work we did to this made it just that much better of a driving car. I love the fact that the suspension is adjustable now. So we made a bunch of sparks, cut a bunch of pieces off, got rid of the shock towers, put the Heights Mustang 2 suspension system in. And I have to say, I've worked on a ton of these early Mustangs. And this is literally the most solid Mustang that I've ever done one of these projects on. It was super easy to install and it changes the way this car feels. It just really improves the handling characteristics, the steering, and even your brake upgrades, the stopping. The car feels really good going down the road. I like the ride quality and it feels great. Tracks good in corners. Uh, a lot of fun. The steering upgrade to rack and pinion makes a huge difference too. So definitely this was the right choice. This is so much better. Much, much quicker responses to your inputs. As a driver, the steering, the brakes are a lot better. Much, much better. And um, the, the five speed really, really wakes it up too. Really matches the power delivery of our 351. I think this is, this is a great, great combination. The 351 Windsor was absolutely the correct choice for this car. Anybody can do a 302. It's going to fit. We know it is. It came in this. Actually, 68 was the first year for 302, but uh, that's too easy. Sometimes the low-hanging fruit, you just want to steer a little bit clearer of that and make it a little more car crafty. Let's use a truck motor, right? Yeah, it sounds like a, like a vintage muscle car it's with a chambered muffler. Yeah. It's just going to resonate in the cabin. Yeah. So what? Yeah, I'm fine yeah. with that. I like the fact that I can roll into it a little bit. Right. I like a car that I can drive to work and I can take into the mountains on the weekend and the, you know, Malibu, the canyon roads. Yeah. So um, I could drive this thing to California. He's trying and... to talk me out of it. He wants to drive it to California. <laughs> you know, you need to put some miles on this thing, Kevin. Let me do that for you. Mm -hmm.